Hello, everyone. I know we're starting a bit earlier, but I want to make sure that everyone has plenty of time and that we have time for questions and answers after everyone has presented. So this, it's great to have everyone here. I know there are some parents and special friends and relatives. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, there's some parents from Seattle. There's a parent from Connecticut. So it's incredible to have everyone out here to, to uh, support the seniors who are so gamely going to present tonight. And by the way, just so you know, the lineup, Larissa's going first, is they, they basically picked numbers from a hat. And the person who's going last picked first. And so it, was, it really was totally random. So I just, you know, AF evenings, this is our last AF evening. So it's really special for those of you who are not here all the time to experience this. We do this four nights a week. We do lunches, we do tea. And so I do want to do a little bit of shout outs to some special people. And I'm going to start with our incredible kitchen staff, including all of our students, the chef. They are amazing. Chef Dave and his crew put out great food for us every night and at lunch, and then the army of students really enables us to not pick up after ourselves and not to worry, just to have a great time. So thank you, everyone. I also want to shout out to David Edwards and Lydia. I mean, they really hold the front office together. And without them, we absolutely could not do this. The tech team is here every night. Um, videotaping whether the person wants to post or not. They're videotaping tonight, so for those of you whose parents couldn't be here, or for those of you who want to share later on with family members, I'll be sending everyone the link so that you can share with grandparents and cousins and siblings, etc. And finally, I want to do a shout out to my incredible Ath Fellows. So I think we can all agree that Isabel and Wes are just exemplary. I mean, they are wonderful at their introductions. They're wonderful at making everyone feel comfortable at the head table. They're gregarious and funny and warm, and I'll stop embarrassing them. But I want them to come up and receive something from us at the app here. Come on up, 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 up. So, these are incredibly special chargers. Don't eat off of them. Just hang them on a wall. But um, it says Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. They were specially commissioned when the Ath was constructed some years ago. So this is for you. And, and also, so you know, um, you're going to be embarrassed by this. So we're starting a tradition where the photograph that was taken of the fellows right as they were starting the school year is being reproduced and is going to be framed. And we're starting kind of a gallery of Ath Fellows. And so you are going to be the inaugural Ath Fellows. I'm going to try to go back a little bit. I'm going to go back a little bit. I wanted to have them here, but, they're, but it's, it wasn't ready. So in any case, with that, thank you for coming. Enjoy the evening. And I'm going to let Isabel and Wes take it from here. Good evening. Um, thank you, Priya, for that um, really generous uh, gesture and gift and those kind words. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Wesley Whitaker, and I just wanted to say that um, alongside Isabel here, it has been a pleasure and an honor to serve uh, as your Ath Fellows this year, to converse, to share a meal, and to learn alongside all of you. It has really been the highlight of my CMC experience, so I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. Um, and with that, Isabel, do you have our introduction for tonight? I do. <laughs> so good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. So this year we have hosted a little over 80 speakers of diverse backgrounds with varying realms of expertise, each with their own unique story to share. But we close off this speaker series with a special event because we will be hearing from some of our own peers and friends on the topics that they are passionate about and the questions that they have endeavored to answer. So, uh, as always, 
please refrain from taking any video or audio recordings. Please silence or put away your mobile devices at this time. And please join me in welcoming all of your seniors uh, who will be presenting tonight. So we're starting the night off on a very light-hearted note. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Larissa Peltola. Thank you, Priya, for inviting me. This is a really special honor. Um, so my topic of my thesis is uh, rape and sexual violence used as a weapon of war and genocide. Before I start, I wanted to uh, give a special thank you to the advisors that helped me uh, and guided me through this journey. Professor Petropoulos is here. Um, thank you so much for, for all of your help. I, I could not have done it without you. And then a special shout out to Professor Wendy Lauer, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, before I start, also I wanted to give sort of a trigger warning. I think, as you can probably tell, it's a very intense topic. Um, so it's very challenging, so if anyone needs to leave throughout, I understand, I promise I won't be offended. So rape and sexual violence have, used, have, been, have been used against civilian populations since the advent of armed conflict. Uh, however, recent scholarship within the past few decades, mostly since the early 80s and 90s, um, has proved that rape is not actually a byproduct of war or transgressions of a few individuals, but rather it's used as a calculated tool of war, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. So this led me to my question of my thesis is, um, why do soldiers rape, and why is rape and sexual violence such an effective weapon in war? The first of these explanations is that rape is used for dehumanization and an exertion of power. This was commonly seen during the Holocaust against women within ghettos and concentration camps, and in Rwanda against the Tutsi population, as well as in the Guatemalan genocide. Um, it is also used as a punishment, as well as an effort to intimidate communities to prevent political uprisings and insurgencies. And it is also used to destroy the social cohesion and the social fabric of communities. This is done in part, in part by targeting communities um, that, whose members are particularly reliant on each other, as well as an effort to emasculate men who couldn't protect the female members of their communities. And likewise, the stigma that comes with rape, women are often cast out of their communities and face ostracization uh, every day. Soldiers also use sexual violence to target the female reproductive capacities, both through forced pregnancy and forced abortions. And rape is also a form of ethnic cleansing as well as genocide. And it is used as a weapon for the purpose of eliminating an undesired ethnic, uh, ethnic religious, or cultural group. Rape can be used to create another generation of children that are genetically less of a specific group um, through forced impregnation to prevent births of an undesired group. And soldiers can intentionally spread uh, sexually transmitted diseases and infections such as HIV AIDS. Um, and then it's really important to expand the definition just from traditional rape, which involves the uh, lack of consent to sexual activity. Um, but also expanding sexual violence to various forms uh, of, of violence that go beyond rape, including sexual slavery and sex trafficking, sex for survival and barter sex, uh, forced marriage and forced copulation, forced prostitution, as well as forced abortions, sterilizations, and contraceptives. So this is essential when we're examining why sexual violence is so effective in war is because it goes beyond just um, the traditional way we see rape. So it's weird formatting, but um, I wanted to show, these are all of the case studies that I looked at, starting with the Holocaust, Cambodia, Guatemala, the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and then the Rohingya and the Yazidi, which are happening today. So I wanted to show the, the deaths, um, the death toll from each of the conflicts, as well as the number of rapes that happened during the conflicts. Um, obviously, because of lack of reporting and just overall difficulties in uh, finding women and getting women to talk about their experiences. Rapes are actually uh, always underreported and are most likely a lot higher. And then I wanted to point out that there is an unknown number of women that were raped during the Holocaust, primarily because there wasn't really this discourse that um, that rape was seen, or it was seen as something that happened, particularly with the um, Soviet Red Army against uh, German women, as opposed to uh, a part of the Nazi campaign against uh, Jewish Roma and LGBTQ communities. 
and then also the Cambodian genocide. Part of the Khmer Rouge, um, what they did was actually impose forced marriage and forced population. So the number of women that were forcibly married to other Cambodian men was so astronomically high that it's nearly impossible to determine how many of those women were raped because they couldn't have given consent within those forced marriages. And lastly, the, we don't have any information on the Rohingya refugee crisis because it, um, the most recent bout of violence started you know, almost two years ago. And there's still reports coming in uh, and women that are escaping to Bangladesh um, as refugees. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the main argument of my thesis, which is how to improve prosecution of genocidal rape within international criminal courts. So beginning with um, the Nuremberg trials and the Tokyo trials following the Second World War, those were the first ever genocide tribunals that, um, that we saw in the international community. Um, because rape was only seen as a byproduct of war rather than a stri strategic and specific objective, there were actually no mention of crimes of sexual violence in Nuremberg, and a very brief mention of sexual violence in response to the comfort women who were sex slaves for Japan's um, army uh, in the Tokyo tribunals. So then next we see the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and for um, Rwanda. Those were a significant step in the right direction in prosecuting genocidal rape. Uh, in the uh, Yugoslavian tribunal, out of 78 testimonies, um, or I'm sorry, out of 78 defendants, 32 were convicted for crimes of sexual violence, which seemed like an incredible step in the right direction for prosecution of genocidal rape. However, um, few victims' testimonies were included in the tribunal, and years later, several of the rape convictions were actually overturned. And then in Rwanda, it wasn't until a year into the tribunal that rape was actually included as a specific crime. Um, and with the exception of the case of Jean-Paul Akayesu, who was convicted for genocidal rape, out of all of the convictions in Rwanda, an overwhelming 90% of judgments did not include any rape or sexual violence convictions or charges. Um, and so only two of those cases resulted uh, in prosecution of genocidal rape. Next, most recently, the International Criminal Court was established in 1998 amid uh, these two uh, tr tribunals. Uh, it's meant to be a permanent legal body that has the authority to try war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And the ICC, what's really significant about it, it has its own investigative and prosecution body that does not rely on outside actors to begin prosecuting war crimes and genocides. So this provides more leeway for prosecutors to begin trying um, genocidal rape. And then I wanted to discuss some of the failures um, in prosecution of genocidal rape within an international setting because today, still, uh, rape remains the least condemned war crime. Even though it's very obvious that it's been used in every, used in every war for as long as war has been around. The first of these failures is that rape is considered an afterthought in many cases and there's also a lack of political will. So a lot of times um, attorneys find it too difficult to prosecute genocidal rape or to find the, the proof for it, so they just don't want to address it at all. Um, the next uh, shortcoming or failure that we see is that there are legal, investigative, and procedural, procedural fails, failures when it comes to prosecution. Uh, for example, poor collection of evidence or victim testimonies, uh, insensitivity to working with victims, um, which makes them least likely to come forward, and just overall unwillingness to prosecute genocidal rape. The third failure in international courts is actually impunity for crimes of sexual violence and few in the overall grand scheme are actually tried. So very few people are actually tried, even fewer are convicted. And lastly and most importantly, the biggest oversight when it comes to prosecuting uh, genocidal rape and sexual violence is the lack of victims' voices uh, within these proceedings. Relatively few victims uh, feel comfortable testifying or want to testify in these court trials and even fewer are taken on as advisors or consultants during these trials, which is very significant. Um, but there's also hope. I wanted to leave this very depressing topic on a hopeful note. Um, in my uh, working with different advisors and having different um, uh, interviews with people who've actually prosecuted genocidal rape, I came up with uh, three separate recommendations for three separate individuals. Um, you guys can see them here, but I wanted to touch on, uh, in closing, what individuals can do. So what everyone in this room can do in order to support victims of genocidal rape as well as make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, so we are all charged with changing and helping shape 
the discourse around wartime rape. So we need to make sure that everyone in this room understands that this is not a byproduct of war, that this happens on a strategic level and is leveled against the most innocent members of our population. And it happens everywhere. This is not specific to, to a country, to a specific group of people. It happens all the time. Um, so we are all charged with that. We have to work with to support victims and survivors by donating and volunteering for NGOs and nonprofits that work with victims and raising awareness about the needless suffering of countless um, women and girls across the world. Finally, we have to use our voices as American citizens through contacting our Congress people and bringing attention to these crimes. There are literally two genocides that are happening at this very moment as we sit here in the ath and little is being done to stop it. Like the amount of rapes and sexual violence that are occurring against Yazidi and Rohingya women is unbelievable. And very few of us know about it. I'm hoping that more of us care now that we do know. Um, but it's our job as human beings to make sure that we end this painful suffering. And history will not look kindly on us if we don't act to stop these human rights violations. So I, with that being said, I hope that I was able to uh, bring it into a little more positive note. And uh, thank you so much for, for having me. All right, before I get started, first I'd like to thank Priya for the opportunity to speak about my thesis. It's really exciting to get to talk about something that I'm really passionate about and have worked really hard on. So. I am a neuroscience major, also pre-med, and I've been working in Professor Reed's Cognitive Neuroscience Lab for three years now. So Professor Reed is one of my readers, as is Professor Coleman. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, so I'm first gonna talk a little bit about the motivation for my thesis, then what I did and what I found, and then lastly, something that I've learned um, throughout my thesis journey. So my thesis process is a little unusual in that it began my junior spring continued throughout the summer, and then also was a year-long experimental um, thesis throughout my senior year. During the spring of my junior year, Professor Reed um, began a new project, and I was just starting to think about what I would do for my senior thesis. And in this project, um, we measure different personality traits, clinical disorders, and life experiences, and then explore how those individual differences relate to different patterns of brain activity. For my thesis, I could choose any one of these measures and then investigate their effect on a specific cognitive function. I knew that I wanted to choose a topic that was important and applicable to many people and that also had clinical implications. As I continued working over the summer and after looking into a few topics, I decided to investigate the brain's response to error because mistakes occur almost every single day. And although the actual mistake is normally unimportant in the larger context of our lives, the ability to recognize correct from incorrect responses and our response to error has important consequences on our ability to refine future performance. Do we recognize, reflect, and learn from our mistakes? Or do we become paralyzed so that the error is debilitating and hinders our learning? I'm interested in the differences in the brain that drive the varying error responses. Previous research has shown that the differences in neural error responses are especially apparent in individuals that are sensitive to negativity. Those who are motivated to perform well and attribute significant value to correct responses will exhibit larger error responses than those who are unmotivated. Also, an individual's emotional reaction to that error can influence the brain's response. Two disorders that have been associated with atypical error processing are anxiety and depression. In some form, these disorders are very common in the US, and I personally know friends and family that are affected by anxiety and depression, making my thesis especially important to me and hopefully to a lot of people. So in the past, when researchers investigate the disorders and their influence on error processing, they only investigate one disorder at a time but I believe that they could be missing significant interactions between the disorders. In the general population, the lifetime rate of comorbidity or co-occurrence of the two disorders is between 40 to 98%. After learning this, I was really surprised that previous research hasn't investigated how they interact together. So in addition to measuring anxiety and depression alone, for my thesis, I decided to investigate how the two disorders interact to influence the error response. 
To do this, I recruited undergraduates from the Claremont Colleges and I measured their anxiety and depression symptom severity using the Beck Anxiety and Beck Depression inventories. Then, participants came into the lab and I recorded their brain activity using electroencephalography while they completed a computer task designed to elicit errors. Electroencephalography, also known as EEG, in simple terms, um, records your electrical activity in your brain. And by looking at a specific time window, when the participant makes a response to error, we can extract important information about what's going on in the brain. And then to compare the effects of the different disorders, I group participants into four categories. Anxiety alone, depression alone, comorbidity, and a healthy group according to inventory standards. What I found, there we go, <laughs> um, is summarized here. So each colored line is a different group that we had. And then on the left is the brain's response to correct trials. And then on the right is the brain's response to incorrect trials. So as you can see, the healthy group exhibits a large error response such that the brain's clearly distinguishing between when they're correct and when they're incorrect. However, the depressed group exhibits a diminished response such that they're still processing error but they don't distinguish as well between correct and incorrect trials. Interestingly, the comorbid group, individuals who have anxiety and depression, do not show a neural distinction between correct and incorrect responses at all. Their brain responds the same way to mistakes as to being correct. We had one participant that had anxiety alone, and this participant followed a similar pattern as the comorbid group suggesting that anxiety, not depression, is the key disruptor of error processing. Anxiety may have such a strong influence on performance because participants are constantly worried about whether they made a mistake, even when they're correct. So, I believe that there's many important clinical implications from my findings. It appears that in high-functioning college students, at least, anxiety may be more debilitating than depression to cognitive processing. The inability to distinguish between correct and incorrect responses can negatively impact learning. And this is important for health professionals to know for targeted learning, coping strategies, and possible clinical interventions. According to my findings, it might be useful to first treat the symptoms of anxiety before treating depression. Our data collection is ongoing to increase the power of our results and hopefully have an anxiety alone comparison group in order to draw some more meaningful conclusions. So that's the gist of what I found. Um, and just throughout my thesis process, I realized that it's really important to be investigating something that you're passionate about. Thesis is a lot of work from the initial research to experimenting if you're doing a science thesis, and then lastly, the writing stage. And if you don't care about what you're doing and are really interested in it, it's going to make the work so much harder than it already is. One of the most challenging aspects of my thesis process was remaining flexible and open-minded. I often had expectations or predetermined thoughts on what the data would and should show, and then when it didn't, I had trouble adapting. I often would look at the data and had no idea what it meant, and I'm lucky that Professor Reed would help me kind of interpret the results and come up with a new story. Um, but I think some advice to future students who are going to do thesis is to try to remain open-minded to unexpected findings because you never know what exciting results you might discover. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight and for listening. Yeah. <laughs>
the one that's going to be sustainable in the future, not Sears, not Toys R Us. Uh, the reason why it's going to stick around is because it has something to do with community. So that's what I ended up doing my thesis on. All right, so physical retail space is a particular kind of sub-community that can fulfill an important human need. While it's a popular opinion that brick and mortar stores and more broadly physical retail space as a whole does not have a place in the increasing technologically savvy community, Physical retail space offers humans a place to engage that is necessary for their flourishing. Flourishing is Aristotle's term. So here he is, uh, <laughs> great man. Everything and every action has a potential to ultimately be done in the best way it can according to its function. So I was reading my thesis to someone earlier today who's a psych major and she was like, that's way too much philosophy. So to break that down, he is the example of a hammer so a hammer can be used to its best function to nail a nail into, let's say, a wall. I mean, it can also be used to hit someone in the head or like be dropped from a building, but the ultimate goal of a hammer is to be nailed into a wall. So in the same way, flourishing for a human being is the ultimate function of a human. And the best way to do that for us is to engage with other human beings. So flourishing is a defining function, and talking to other people is the way to do that. So this is me. <laughs> um, I was in Greece a year and a half ago, and I happened to take you know one of those Snapchat funny filters that like face switches with random busts of Greek gods. Didn't know I was writing on Aristotle at the time, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> so for Aristotle, a polis is a community that is self-sufficient. That is, that is a community that makes life desirable and lacks nothing. So in the same way that humans flourishing is the best way to be a human, a polis is the best type of community. So, oh, it's a little odd looking, but there's kind of this um, constitutive relationship between a human's flourishing and a polis. So a human can't do the best that it can without interacting with other people, and a polis, this perfect community, can't be a perfect community without people being engaged. So it's this back and forth that uh, neither works without the other. So loyalty and trust is what my reader, Adrian Martin, and I ended up looking at most of my thesis. Uh, these are two capacities that are, that are available to those who participate in a polis. So to, these are kind of, they are the, the basic functions that you learn in a community that maybe you cannot learn without such an opportunity to engage with others. So to be loyal in a community is to show partiality to your fellow members over your non-members, uh, and then trusting in others in your community to abide by your same moral and social justice values uh, certifies that they're of this equal treatment to all the members. So there are sub-communities in, in a polis that of course might not abide by these, um, the example that my reader thought of and that I then used in my thesis as well is like the mafia. That's obviously not conducive to a very good overall community, but it still is a sub-community. But the sub-communities that do embody loyalty and trust do end up being really important to uh, the overall doing and then human flourishing as well. So then why retail space? This is a Westfield Mall that is in Century City, just in downtown. Uh, physical retail space is a particular kind of sub-community that when designed in the right way carries out loyalty and trust. So we participate in a community by engaging in various sub-communities like the physical retail space. The end of physical retail space is to maximize profit, like you can't lie about that. But if the sole, prof or the sole purpose of a community is to maximize profit, then waves of newer and more efficient larger online stores like Amazon would be pushing people out and pushing people to buy on the online marketplace. So the reason why malls and physical retail space is around, it, it means something. So then uh, the purpose of a store has to be something of more value. The reason why people are loyal to a small scale mom and pop store is not that they believe something or believe talking to a knowledgeable person is more efficient or more profit maximizing, profit maximizing it's that it has a more um, moral value to it. So I was able to interview Jonathan Rosenberg, who graduated here in 83. Uh, this is his title, it's very long. 
um, but he works at Google and he's just an all around amazing person. I actually met him at the app, sitting at the head table my freshman year. Uh, so kind of a full circle, it was really cool. Uh, he agreed with me in thinking that the physical retail space will continue to exist in the future, uh, but engagement in the physical retail space will change. People will no longer engage with retailers, retailers for the immediacy of fulfillment, rather to interact with expert representatives and make sure they know exactly what they want for particular goods. So then he went on to distinguish between um, interact or uh, ambiguous goods and commodities that we would maybe need to go to a store for. So an ambiguous good would be something like a light bulb. Of course, you don't need to go to the store to buy a light bulb. You can buy that on Amazon. That's no big deal. But when it comes to um, a certain shirt that you think is going to fit just right or necessarily a restaurant or something like that that would be in these more new malls, that's what's going to stick around and continue in the future. So then we went on to look at some case studies, I guess. Uh, philosophy doesn't really have case studies, but a version. Um, this is Rosa's fresh pizza. So we're again looking at why there are these values in physical retail markets that allow them to continue and pursue into the future. So this Rosa's Pizza Place is a small pizza shop in Philadelphia where or where customers will buy post-it notes to give to homeless people to have a piece of pizza. So a pizza slice is a dollar, but this guy in 2013 went up and said, look, I have an extra dollar. I'd love to buy the next person a piece of pizza, a piece of pizza. So then this wall, as you can see, there's hundreds of sticky notes, um, each representing a piece of pizza for someone who might need it. So the idea is that this Philadelphia pizza shop has a genuine interest in the well-being of all of those who share in their community. Uh, it's more than just a place to buy a piece of pizza. So the reason why Rose's Fresh Pizza has this pay it forward model and the reason why it's so successful is not because it's been proven to be the most profit maximizing, which is supposedly the end of a business, but rather that this model offers citizens a way to help their fellow community members. So this is CCA, some of you might know it. <laughs> um, also another case study. So craft beer, I'm from Colorado by the way, so craft beer is a, a big deal in my state. Um, craft beer has increased in popularity in recent years. 6.2% sales increase since 2015 compared to domestic beer's 0% increase. So craft brewing is done in small scale, small batches, local, um, and it's competing with these very large competitors like Anheuser-Busch. Um, Anheuser-Busch produces Budweiser, Corona, Stella Artois, just to say a couple. Um, but recently, Anheuser has had difficulty competing with the draw of a local brewery. So this kind of points again to the idea of profit maximization versus some other value that we get from loyalty and trust. So Anheuser's sole function is to maximize profit. Uh, craft breweries like CCA care more about the actual craft of craft brewing. So the defining function of CCA, honing fine beer, makes money, or, and not making money just for the sole purpose of its creation. Um, the passion of brewing beer and the wish to do so to the best of its ability is not just profit maximizing. So then, oh, come on, there we go. This is again another development that my internship did over the summer. This one's in Utah. Uh, as you can see, there's like a fountain and a movie theater. Um, there's apartment buildings. It's in downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, the idea is that if Rosenberg's, Jonathan Rosenberg's uh, dichotomy is true between ambiguous and goods that will go buy at a store, uh, the physical retail space um, does still contribute to the polis as a space that promotes engagement. Uh, physical retail space now will be home though to like smaller, more niche sets of products. Again, not things like a light bulb. So the model like this one that's increasingly becoming popular is this mixed use idea that you'll go to one of these places, this is called Station Park, to have an experience. So you're gonna go and have a meal and then you're gonna go see a movie or you'll go to the, the fountain show and see the concert that's there on a Saturday night. And it's more than just going to go buy a shirt at a mall. So to finish off, 
the relationship between specialization, trust, and loyalty in the physical retail space maximizes engagement in the polis. What we value in interacting in a physical retail space subcommunity is the sense of loyal contribution to the community's end and the sense of trust that is conveyed in that mutual contribution. So this conclusion, it still sounds kind of interesting when you're talking to people who, yes, Toys R Us is going out of business. Yes, JCPenney is struggling. Like these large anchor stores are having a hard time. But when you think about what is attractive about these malls like, like this one, it's more than just shopping. So the overall conclusion I found that like, online outlets simply cannot compete with that ability to provide the experience that especially like the millennial market is looking for in the future. Uh, I don't really have anything else written down, but when it comes to talking to juniors who are looking into writing your thesis next year, I did this thesis in the fall, and while I had to pretty much reread it to make this presentation because I haven't looked at it in five months, I loved not having to look at it for five months. <laughs> so if you can, by any means, write your thesis in the fall. It was the best thing you could do for yourself senior year. That's it. So thank you, Priya. This is great. <laughs> Good evening, thank you guys for coming. It, it really means a lot. Um, I'm gonna start with a quick story and a couple pieces of advice uh, before I head straight into the content of my uh, thesis. Um, so a tough story to tell actually. Uh, last week I had decided to dedicate my entire weekend to getting a substantial amount of thesis done. Um, after about seven hours of sleep over three nights, I came to Sunday afternoon uh, doing some final edits, and my thesis ended up looking like this. Uh, so my number one piece of advice to you, first, this was unrecoverable, about 20 pages of thesis, just gone. So my first advice to all of you guys is use Google Docs, back up to box, do whatever you can, save in a bunch of places. <laughs> do not be the guy who loses 20 pages of his work a week before thesis, because as bad as it is to lose all your work, going into IT and having them tell you we told you to back it up on Box is so much worse. <laughs> the next thing is pick an advisor who is going to keep you on top of your work. Pick an advisor who is good at giving you advice. And So Professor Hurley sent me this right after spring break. The shortest email I've ever gotten. No text in the line, just thesis. Um, so Helped me get it done. Uh, him and Professor Thomas uh, over there put in a lot of work uh, into this thesis, helped me develop my ideas a lot. So my second uh, piece of advice to all of you is pick an advisor who fits your topic and fits your personality. Um, now on to the uh, content of my thesis. Um, as you can see, my thesis is about citizenship and addressing issues of citizenship in the modern world. Uh, the two issues I aim to address are, first of all, uh, the issue of unjustified exclusion, which is essentially that there are people who we would say deserve citizenship because they live, work, socially contribute, and are subject to the rule of law in certain places, and still are unable to obtain citizenship. So the case studies I look at in my thesis are those of South Koreans in Japan and Turks in Germany, who have lived there for generations and generations, and are still unable, know no other home, they know the language, um, and yet they're unable to obtain citizenship. The second issue I look at is that of, I guess, a more hollow citizenship or a transactional citizenship, which essentially I define as people uh, neglecting their obligations to fellow citizens and defining citizenship largely by the benefits that come with it as opposed to sharing in the burdens of self-government. Um, so how do I intend on addressing these issues? First of all, I look at three different approaches to citizenship. The first is, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail about them, but I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, the first is the cosmopolitan view. And the cosmopolitan view expresses a commitment to universal human rights, and it questions the nature of birthright citizenship, stating that citizenship affords us a bunch of extremely valuable opportunities and benefits, and insofar as we recognize citizenship as a valuable asset, we don't want it distributed in an arbitrary manner. 
Now, I don't pick where I'm born, none of us do. We don't pick where our parents are from. And so determining the distribution of benefits on such an arbitrary factor as, of, as birthplace or nationality is extremely problematic for the cosmopolitan. So that's where my view aligns with the cosmopolitan view. But I feel like they still neglect the obligations that we hold to fellow citizens. And that's where I look at a more classical liberal view, something expressed, something that you know maybe John Rawls or Thomas Nagel expresses. Um, and in reviewing that, they ground uh, obligations to fellow citizens in involuntary membership in a political community. So essentially, none of us have chosen to be born as American citizens. Yet despite that, the American government does things in our name. And so we have an obligation and a responsibility to justify the institutions and the decisions of the governments that affect all of our lives and create inequalities that give some of us advantages and some of us disadvantages. So that's where the classical liberal comes and says, these are where this obligation of justice comes from. Where my view differs from the, liberal de from the classical liberal view is that it grounds these obligations in consent. I argue that you can actually choose which political community you want to be a part of, and you can choose to leave a certain community if you don't consent to the laws of that society or in the institutions of that society. And so this is where I find the biggest shortcoming in the classical liberal theory when John Rawls makes the mistaken assumption that we live, that we live in a closed society where entry is only by birth and exit is only by death. And I think my personal story, the fact that I have, I'm a US citizen and a Pakistani citizen. I have, before college, never lived in the US. I have never lived in Pakistan. I've lived in three other different countries. Um, so I think that's testament to the fact that we don't live in a closed society and can no longer continue from John Rawls' mistaken assumption. Um, so this leads me to, I guess, a consensual model of citizenship. What does consent require? Well, John Locke says, that we tacitly consent to being a part of a political community simply by participating. But the thing is, we look at Adam Smith's response to that and he says it is essentially like carrying a man onto a ship, sailing that ship out to sea, and telling that man that because you are on the ship you consent. It's obviously not true, right? So we need to give these people somewhere to go if they are to exercise a legitimate right to leave and express their consent if they don't leave. So the first thing I look to, I guess, uh, actualize in my model of citizenship is realistic rights to entry and exit. Now, how do we justify a right to entry in other places? Well, if we're giving our people a right to leave, they need somewhere to go. In the current world, every single piece of land is divided into sovereign areas. So if we leave the United States, we are in someone else's land. Now, if we expect those people to recognize us and accept us into their political communities at some point, then we have a concurrent obligation to respect other people's rights to entry in our own society. Because without the mutual acceptance of this obligation, rights to entry actually mean nothing. So that's the first part, is rights to entry and exit. The second part, is the obligations, assigning meanings to the obligations that we actually owe one another. Um, in order to kind of explore this, I looked at a civic republican uh, view on citizenship expressed by the likes of Michael Sandel, Michael Walzer, um, and the like. And essentially what they say is that citizenship requires more than simply voting or paying your federal taxes. It requires deliberating with your fellow citizen about what the common good is. It requires a sense of community and belonging, and it requires a moral obligation to your fellow citizens. Now, what I consider to be the model that I envision is a plurality of different societies, all governed by different moral principles, whereby people can choose which society they want to be a part of, which society will most authentically allow them to pursue their conception of the good, whilst also recognizing the collective good of the entire society. So just a quick, re just a quick uh, outline on some of the, I guess, um, conditions of this social contract that I envision. Uh, the first one would be a residency requirement. 
In order to sympathize and deliberate about the common good, one needs to understand the struggles and the circumstances of their fellow citizens. In order to do that, you need to share a life. You need to share certain experiences. And part of that is living together. But that's not all that residency requires. It would measure the quality of residency as well. How much are you contributing to your political society? Can you prove yourself to be trustworthy of taking on these obligations that you have to fellow citizens? And furthermore, the second part, I guess, is a knowledge requirement. In order to affect the common good, in order to participate politically, one needs to have knowledge of the workings of the government, how they can have an impact, and also to an extent, you need to speak the same language as people around you. Because if you can't converse with the, your fellow citizens, then you can't have a meaningful conversation and deliberate about what the common good is. And finally, and this might be somewhat uh, controversial to certain people, but I would have a national service requirement because uh, I feel that, and this is not in the same sense as let's say Israel or Singapore have it where it's mandatory military service for everybody. I would have a certain amount of choice involved in it. And there are two reasons why I think national service is important. Uh, first of all, it shows a dedication to your community. You're spending time, you're spending money, and you're giving up something in order to dedicate your work and your efforts to the whole community. And the second thing is that you're working with other people. National service is a collective action. It is something that will allow you to build social bonds that bridge the gaps between uh, race and ethnicity and religion and nationality and will unite us over certain concepts, uh, a sense of belonging that will unite us. Um, in terms of what that national service would entail, um, I would argue that you would have to have a lot of choice in terms of the ways that you serve your country. Some might be military, you might be able to serve in the Peace Corps, maybe serving in non, working for nonprofit organizations or the federal government or even state governments. Um, so just to finish, I'm gonna go through some of the, I guess, uh, issues or shortcomings of something like this. And the first thing is, if you have that much choice in the way you serve your country, I feel like in a place like the United States, you might find a lot of conservatives serving in the military force and a lot of liberals who are not, who are serving in nonprofits or the Peace Corps or federal government, whatever it may be. So there is a risk that you actually divide a community as opposed to unite it, which would be the goal of national service. The second shortcoming, I guess, is that if you allow people to willy-nilly leave a community and let's say a community like the United States were to open up its borders to the rest of the world, we would have a mass migration of people from much less fortunate countries looking to take, advantages of, looking to take advantage of the opportunities available to them in the US. So part of our obligations in recognizing such an ideal world citizenship or citizenship on a global scale would be to increase the value of citizenship in those poorer places. Um, and I think that's uh, about all I have to say, so thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everybody. So my name is Michael, and I'm also a pretty rare major at CMC. I'm an economics major. <laughs> and uh, first thing I wanna do is, uh, I just wanna give a shout out to all the seniors in the room, so please join me and giving them a round of applause for finishing their thesis. Thank you. Uh, next, I also wanted to thank uh, Professor Anticole, who's been a mentor to me throughout college and who also served as my thesis reader in the economics department this spring. Uh, she was really a tremendous source of guidance for me uh, for each step throughout my thesis journey. And I also wanted to thank uh, Professor Lynch and Professor Selick, who were able to uh, join me today, and they also um, you know, really taught me a lot and motivated me throughout college as well. And for my thesis in economics, uh, I titled it The Battle of the Siblings, uh, The Effect of Birth Order on the Probability of Working in Managerial Professional Occupations. So I chose this topic because I was interested in seeing how your birth order, which is the order that you're, that you're born into a family, affects the type of job that you have. 
Uh, specifically, I examined if being a first, second, or third or later born child affected the probability that you work in a managerial or professional occupation in the United States. So I chose this topic because I wanted to uh, contribute to the divisive debate on birth order that's existed for over a century. So leading psychologists have argued that birth order exerts a significant and profound influence on personality development. And just to give a brief example of some psychology theories on birth order, I first just wanted to ask uh, how many people here are oldest childs in their family? All right, so congratulations. Alfred Adler, a leading psychologist, theorized that oldest uh, children are typically assertive, natural-born leaders, and drawn to power due to early expectations as children to take care of their siblings um, you know, at a very early age. And perhaps this may be one reason why uh, you naturally gravitated towards CMC. Uh, <laughs> the next question that I have is, how many people here are middle child? Okay. So the literature on you says that you are easygoing, uh, friendly, yet a little bit competitive due to a desire to always keep up with your older siblings and to get attention fr uh, from them as well. And lastly, how many of you guys are youngest children? All right, so unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> So unfortunately, the psychology literature on you says that <laughs> youngest children are typically a little bit less ambitious, rebellious, natural rule breakers, and a little bit pampered. And <laughs> psychologists argue that this is because parents typically uh, baby younger children. Although these theories may be interesting and make sense intuitively, a lot of studies have also found little to no evidence of birth order effects. Thus, I was really uh, fascinated by this because I've taken a lot of psychology classes and I really wanted to contribute to this debate specifically uh, in economics. So one reason why I was really interested in my topic as I was kind of doing my literature review is I noticed that the literature on birth order in the field of economics was pretty sparse. So economic studies have found some evidence that firstborn children are more likely to be uh, more educated and earn higher wages than later born siblings. And one reason that economists have proposed, it's called the resource dilution model. And the resource dilution model posits that first born children benefit from extra access to financial and social resources from their parents before extra siblings um, are born. And thus, uh, economists argue that these comparative advantages can persist into adulthood and maybe why uh, firstborn children kind of attain these advantages. So however, um, another perhaps shortcoming that I noticed in the literature was that there hasn't been too much done on birth order and occupational outcomes in economics. And to the best of my knowledge to confirm so, only two studies in the United States have been conducted to see how your birth order affects the type of job that you have. And these studies have just found generally that firstborn children are more likely to be in manager positions and also that they're more likely to be in high skilled uh, occupations. So therefore, uh, in my thesis, I really had uh, four goals that I'll talk about very briefly. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to do was to really fill the gap in the literature on birth order and occupational outcomes in economics. Uh, the second goal that I had was I wanted to expand the occupations that have previously been researched by combining managerial and professional occupations into one joint category. And I did this because um, I think in our generation today, a lot of um, students are interested in either working in a manager job or in a professional job. So that's kind of why I decided to make this focus in my thesis. And one unique thing that I did in my thesis was I wanted to decompose the managerial professional field into occupational categories by the spread of gender. And the reason why I decided to do this was because uh, one of the papers that I modeled my study off of, um, it was by Alice Grinberg in 2015. She found that firstborn children are more likely to be managers, but she found that this effect was only found when she controlled only for birth order and no other variables. And uh, one reason that my reader and I kind of hypothesized was that this may have happened because um, studies such as these may have combined jobs that are typically dominated by males or females. 
And in these occupational categories, it is possible that there are different skill and education requirements, and thus, like past models may not have been capturing really the effect and distribution of gender in a job. So thus, uh, one thing that I try to do in my study is I decompose the managerial professional field into male-dominated, uh, female-dominated, and mixed-gender fields, um, just to see if birth order effects differ when I spread it out by gender. And the last thing that I do is I also examine the effect of birth order on STEM managerial professional positions. And the reason why I did that is um, there's been a lot of interest in STEM over the last decade just because of factors such as high salaries, the ability to work in an innovative field, and just because of the ability to be um, very creative and do cool work. So that's the four goals of my thesis. And uh, unfortunately, due to time constraints, I'm not going to talk about the statistics behind my study. I'm just going to briefly um, summarize some of the main takeaways. So as I was doing my study, um, I took my data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, which is a survey conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, every two years. And the sample size was about 5,123 respondents. And uh, I find limited evidence of birth order effects, and what I find is that when I control only for birth order, I find that being a firstborn makes you approximately 6% more likely to be in a managerial professional field than third or later born children. However, this effect also goes away similar to past papers when I control for additional factors such as uh, demographic controls or education. And thus, in order to see if birth order effects still hold, I decomposed the field by gender into male-dominated and female-dominated fields, and this time I'm still able to find that firstborns are more likely to be in managerial professional fields in male-dominated and male-dominated fields than third or later-born children, which is great. And this kind of helps support my hypothesis that birth order only matters in certain categories when you decompose it by gender. And uh, one thing that surprised me when I was um, doing the results for STEM was I found slight evidence that third or later born children are more likely to be in STEM managerial professional positions than first born children. And this was initially surprising to me because of the resource dilution model that I talked about. But uh, one paper in 1980, it was by Lynch and Lynch, and they found that um, third and later born children are perhaps more likely to be in such fields because in the study they found that youngest children prefer jobs that are more artistic and have more creative capabilities. So perhaps this is one reason uh, why they're in STEM fields, which are, have a little bit more to do with creativity and producing products. And thus, uh, in conclusion, I find limited evidence of birth order effects, but I think it still shows that the type of job that you have might depend on the amount of resources available in the family, which depends ultimately upon your birth order. And I think one future study that may be interesting is just to see how birth order effects in the United States compare across different cultures, uh, perhaps throughout the world, as well as also across um, different socioeconomic communities, which have different levels of um, financial resources, et cetera. And lastly, I just wanted to give a couple of words of advice for thesis. So I think the first is many of us in college um, probably think we're master procrastinators and we've perfected that skill. But unfortunately for thesis, this is probably one of the few times where procrastination is probably gonna hurt a lot. So just start early and meet regularly with your reader. And I think my last point of advice is, I guess uh, don't be afraid when you start thesis next semester because I think when you look at doing such a big research project, I think the prospect is often very daunting, but I think you should all be very confident in yourselves just because of uh, the great education we've all had here, and also you guys are all capable, so just be confident in yourself, start early, and it will totally be okay. And that's all I have for today, thank you. simulation of emotional body movement. It is a psych honors thesis with um, Professor Catherine Reed and Allison Harris. Um, and I would just really like to thank them for all their guidance and support throughout this process because I wouldn't have been able to done it at all without them. Um, we're experts at recognizing the actions of others. 
And, um, but how we're capable of doing this is a question that has been a topic of debate in cognitive psychology and neuroscience. The simulation theory proposes one explanation by explaining that we mentally reenact others' actions with our own sensory motor systems in order to understand those actions. We are also especially good at recognizing emotions in actions, and emotions are often high in social salience. So simulation theorists propose that we um, understand others' emotions also through simulating the actions that they take when expressing those emotions. So we understand emotions vicariously rather through reasoning or inference. This leads to my in experimental question. Does socially salient information, um, that is emotion, actually elicit more mental simulation of others' actions? We answered this question by measuring the extent of simulation using electroencephalography. Um, in EEG data, we can find oscillations at certain frequencies over the sensory motor cortex. The power or amplitude of these oscillations indicate varying levels of neural activity. Um, and specifically for our measures, suppressed power is as associated with greater activity in the sensory motor cortex. We look at mu suppression, um, which is the suppression of power at 9 to 12 hertz frequency. In EEG data, it shows up on a scalp map uh, like this. The um, triangle on this map is the nose, and we are looking at the head from uh, a top-down view. And mu suppression occurs both when we execute our own actions and when we observe the actions of others. This is taken to be evidence for the simulation theory because it shows that at some level, our experience of observing others' actions is the same as our experience of carrying out our own actions. Mu suppression also occurs most strongly for biologically plausible actions that we can represent with our own bodies. We also find similar effects in a different frequency band, at beta band, and so beta suppression and mu suppression are both measures of simulation. We measure mu and beta suppression while subjects viewed emotional versus neutral body movements. The stimuli that we used were point light displays, um, and uh, these are two examples of point light displays, as you can see here. Um, they're like stick figures that move um, uh, in different ways. And an example of an emotional point light display um, with uh, showing anger would be a figure walking towards the camera with their fists ra raised. And neutral actions that we used are touching toes, jumping on one foot, and walking. We also created control stimuli by scrambling these point light displays, and we do this by randomizing the movement of each dot to a different location on the figure. And so all of the basic visual inputs of our control stimuli are the same, except when you look at the picture on the right, uh, it no longer embodies any um, biologically plausible human form, and so we wouldn't expect any simulation for the scrambled stimuli. In our experiment, basically, participants watched the scrambled and experimental stimuli in two separate blocks, and they were asked to monitor for video repetition. So when two videos occur uh, uh, consecutively, subjects press the button. We did this just to make sure that they were viewing the videos that were showing. Our experimental prediction is very simple. We expect more mu or beta suppression to occur in response with emotional versus neutral stimuli. So more mental simulation when emotion is present. And we um, expect this effect to occur after we control for the basic visual inputs by subtracting the neural responses to the scrambled stimuli. Um, our data can be visualized in a time frequency plot. It might look a little bit confusing like this, um, but I can walk you through. On the y-axis, we have frequency range, and as you can see, the frequency re range that we look at was from 4 hertz to 20 hertz. On the x-axis, we have time within trial, with 0 being the point where the video starts playing and 3 being the point where the video ends. Um, the colors on the graph indicate very varying levels of power, so the blue colors indicate less power in the emotional condition relative to the neutral, whereas the brighter colors indicate more power in the neutral relative to, uh, in the emotional relative to the neutral. Since we're looking for a suppression effect, what is interesting here is this band of suppression that occurs kind of in the middle of a trial. And we found that this suppression effect was significant um, at 1.3 to 1.5 seconds. And after finding that significance, we separately look at mu and beta bands, which would reflect simulation. 
And both of these effects were separately significant as well. The mu power suppression mapped on, as we would expect, to kind of uh, central and uh, parietal areas, because literature has shown that mu is supposed to come from sensory areas more towards the back of the brain, uh, whereas beta suppression comes more from primary motor areas towards the front of the brain, and it maps onto more central and frontal locations. So in conclusion, we found more support for our hypothesis that a greater level of mental simulation is elicited by socially salient movement. And um, this is additional support for the idea that we simulate body movements in order to understand the emotions behind those movements. And um, our results uh, is consistent with the growing body of literature on how sensory motor areas are actually involved in higher level cognition. So the way that we process movement and execute movement is involved in how we actually reason and think about the world at a higher level. On the other hand, this is the disruption of sensory motor processes may be associated with impairments in ability to process social information. Some examples of where these impairments occur is in autism and schizophrenia. Both of these disorders are associated with an impaired ability to perceive other people's intentions or mental states. So with autism, it's uh, recognizing emotion and understanding intent. With schizophrenia, it's misreading neutral actions as carrying malicious intent. And also, both of these disorders co-occur with motor impairments. Um, for example, autistic children exhibit repeti rep repetitive movement, pacing, apathetic immobility, um, and motor disorders are also associated with schizophrenia. And so our study provides more evidence for the link between motor skills and social skills, and it does this in a way that just studying these disorders behaviorally cannot, because um, when we only look at the disorders, we do not know if these symptoms have different underlying sources or if they're actually connected in a meaningful way. Um, looking at neuro data allows us to establish a link between the motor and the social in a more concrete way. And yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Brian, uh, and I'm an economics and government double major. And so when I was writing this thesis, um, I'm writing about the United Kingdom, immigration, transnationalism, integration, um, I kind of had a choice whether to take it uh, down the government path or the economics path. Um, and I was pretty scarred by econometrics, I decided I didn't really want to look at re a regression table ever again, so uh, government it was. And uh, Bill was gracious en enough to work with me uh, starting in the summer. Uh, we really started thinking about this in uh, June or July. Um, and I was actually in uh, Ireland at the time. I was in the Republic of Ireland. I was working in an internship, and uh, there were some down hours. So I spent some of that time working on this thesis. And uh, so I'm going to share just a little bit about why I decided to do this, um, some of my findings and my questions, and, uh, and some advice uh, for students who are doing their thesis in the future. So uh, I was actually in the United Kingdom for the Brexit vote. Um, I went two summers in a row to the UK. So I was in Liverpool. and. Uh, all the polling data showed that it was going to be pretty comfortably uh, a remain uh, decision, that the UK was going to remain in Europe. And uh, so people were pretty confident, people were happy, sun was shining, it was, everything was good. Um, and then later that day, the results came out, uh, the UK had decided to leave and there was shock. And there was more than shock, there was uncertainty because people just didn't really know what was going to happen. And a lot of those questions are still unanswered. Um, and so when going about this thesis, I decided to think and kind of examine uh, what's going to happen to all the immigrants in the United Kingdom? Um, not just people from within Europe, but from all over the world uh, who are in the UK and have to negotiate with a new regime uh, that has to redesign its integration policies and its immigration policies. Um, and I'll quickly define integration now. Um, I define integration in my thesis as kind of a sociocultural exchange between the mi minority and majority groups uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is economic, this is social, uh, this is involved in uh, simple cross-cultural interactions uh, that make kind of two dis disparate groups, one. And, and these processes occur over a long period of time um, in many ways. And they've, they've occurred for hundreds of years and thousands of years as long as uh, immigration has been around. Uh, the goal of integration policies in the United Kingdom is to speed up that process, is to make sure that immigrants feel comfortable, that they're, that they're heard, that they understand uh, what the expectations are in the majority culture. And uh, all these things are going to change after Brexit as the United Kingdom kind of goes on its own. Um, and so. What I examine in my thesis is how uh, immigrants who are low skill, uh, kind of less educated um, from sub-Saharan African countries and former colonies of the United Kingdom uh, fare in the United Kingdom, what policies uh, 
affect them, how they interact with the majority, um, and how the change in Brexit and the, the broader social change in the United Kingdom and across much of the West is going to affect uh, their outcomes. Um, so I had to kind of start with a broad uh, cultural model. So the United Kingdom for a long time uh, was a champion of multiculturalism. It was the belief that uh, it was a big melting pot, you know, a term that you oftentimes hear in the United States, but that was very similar uh, in the United Kingdom as well. But in the past couple years, uh, there's been a shift towards nativism to a belief that the concept of Britain is, is unchangeable and then it's under threat. Uh, the idea that East and West are simply incompatible, the clash of civilizations hypothesis that I really delve into in my, in my thesis. And so based on that framework from a changing of multicultural, multiculturalism to nativism, how can immigrants uh, survive and thrive in the United Kingdom? And, and why does this new generation of immigrants require extra support and uh, may have some extra advantages? Um, so the newest period of immigration, uh, especially from uh, places in Africa and Asia, uh, is subject to what is called transnationalism. So there's, back in the olden days, 100 years ago, uh, you would leave your home country to go to your new country, and that's where you'd stay because it was tough to get back, letters took a long time, you couldn't really communicate, you couldn't send money, um, and so you were kind of just forced to assimilate into the host culture, um, which can be really damaging to your own kind of held cultural values from your home country. Uh, new transnationalism is the idea that immigrants can be more global citizens, can exist in their own kind of distinct communities within the larger host society, that they can send remittances home, that they can visit home, that they can Skype home, uh, that they can really continue to participate in their own ethnic and national identity outside of the United Kingdom. So based on that framework, I looked at which specific policies have the greatest impact on the outcomes of immigrants, the economic and social outcomes. And I found that while Brexit gives a pretty dark picture of what's happening on the national level, uh, local politics is really where uh, integration outcomes can shine. Um, so I, I looked at specifically at housing, um, economics, and political participation, three very important parts of um, participating in the United Kingdom where, uh, much like the United States, work is really valued, where you live affects where you work, and immigrants may not have a voice on the national level, but at the local level they can be very powerful. Um, so in order to understand these kind of pressures and these, these variables that needed to be addressed, I looked at uh, case studies in, in Denmark and Germany, uh, two countries who have also had their own influx of immigrants who are very culturally different um, from the rest of the majority and how they've dealt with their pressure. So uh, a lot of it deals with social housing and, and formalization of work permits, a lot of things that I won't really cover right now because they're very specific, it's a very long thesis. But um, what I found is that there is a lot of power in local interactions and local level politics. Uh, people talking to one another, that's what breaks down those barriers. Um, it was found that when people live with immigrants, they're much like, more likely to be tolerant of immigrants. A lot of these kind of very hostile nativism, this conspiracy theories uh, come from people who really have never met, talked to, interacted with immigrants beyond maybe an ethnic cuisine or something that they, they enjoy the benefits of, a, of an ethnic culture but without the real cultural exchange. Um, and then kind of in the last part of my thesis, I do a little bit of forecasting because I believe that what happens in the United Kingdom is going to be important to what happens in many other countries in the West, uh, especially the United States. You know, uh, We've also seen a, a rising tide of nativism, um, maybe a departure from a, an old multicultural model. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I can't necessarily end on a super positive note. Um, if the United Kingdom didn't have the Atlantic Ocean, uh, they would be building a wall. Um, I think that's pretty likely. Um, it's gonna get worse before it gets better um, because despite this kind of regret that happened after the Brexit vote, um, the British government has seemed to understand that the will of the people was to separate itself from the multicultural order and try to re return to a, perhaps a fictional but um, still a, in, an ideal of kind of a, a, a more monocultural Britain. Um, and I guess kind of fortunately, uh, when you look at how the Brexit vote broke down, the people who voted to leave uh, the European Union were from rural areas, they're older, they're less educated, uh, they had much less contact with immigrants. The areas that voted overwhelmingly to stay in the European Union uh, were urban, uh, super diverse, uh, very educated, very young, and so, um, I kind of end my thesis with a little bit of a, 
uh, a hopeful note with a prediction that maybe uh, it'll swing back the other way. Uh, we might go through some dark times, or, or um, at least the United Kingdom will, uh, but the hope is that the younger generation, uh, through greater contact with immigrant and minority groups, has a better understanding of the value that these groups bring to their society. Uh, they have a better understanding of how national values can change, uh, and they can enact that change uh, later in their lives. Um, and to kind of end, uh, this was a year-long thesis. It was a long journey. Um, I think government can be especially interesting because the theses are so long that there is a material time constraint. At a certain point, you can no longer write your thesis in the time you have left. So uh, it's definitely an incentive to start early and write often. Uh, get yourself uh, a really hard-charging reader like Bill, uh, and you'll do OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, I promise in four years I did learn how to spell the word sauce. That is from a 18, uh, 17th century political pamphlet. So I did learn how to spell properly while at CMC. Don't worry, your uh, education is not going to waste. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking a few people. Uh, first and foremost, Priya for inviting me. Uh, to Lisa Cody for offering me to be my reader, stepping outside of her field of expertise and really being supportive to me along the way. And lastly, to my mom who came all the way from Connecticut to listen. So thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, so I am going to talk to you a little bit about barbecue, um, and might as well jump right in. So uh, Davy Crockett's political career, Nat Turner's rebellion, and the 1964 Supreme Court case, Katzenbach versus McClung, all share what might seem like a surprising link, barbecue. Crockett won his first election after commandeering an audience in an 1817 uh, political campaign barbecue, where he told a story and then asked the audience to join him around a whiskey barrel instead of listening to his opponent give his speech. Uh, Nat Turner's Rebellion, one of the most famous slave uprisings in American history, was planned at a barbecue that was representative of a typical form of defiance for enslaved African Americans in the antebellum South. Um, and then the ruling in Katzenbach v. McClung, which forced the owner of Ollie's Barbecue in Alabama to desegregate his restaurant um, because a large percentage of the meat served in the kitchen was uh, brought across state lines, um, set the precedent for the national government using uh, its control over interstate commerce to end state-sanctioned segregation. These three seemingly distinct moments highlight a broader theme, that barbecue has played an integral role in shaping American political culture. This may seem surprising, but from the colonial era through the 20th century barbecue and all of its smoky porcine or possibly bovine, depending on who you're asking, culture um, has not only been a helpful lens through which to view American history, but also a political institution that's been a catalyst for political development and change. If anybody in the audience is sitting there asking how or why did I write a thesis on barbecue as a political institution, you are not the first, and I can't blame you for asking. Um, the answer to the why, the why question is a lot easier. Uh, it represented an opportunity for me to write a thesis on something that combined my loves for food and history, um, and also just happened to check the box on the political portion of my PPE degree as well. Um, I remember sitting in Professor Cody's office last spring, having just finished a paper on the invention and popularization of restaurants as, a, as a, an institution in 18th century Paris and recognized that if I could talk about food and history for a whole semester, why not try and do it for a whole year? Uh, I then sat down and said, well, what's the most political food I can think of? Uh, and barbecue came to mind. The answer to the how portion of that question is a little more long-winded and includes hours spent combing through 18th and 19th century newspaper clippings, a trip to the archives at the University of South Carolina and the College of Charleston, and a deep dive into the cross-cultural symbolism of a pig sauce that combines Native American ingredients with European imports like Madeira. Um, that trip to South Carolina was a particularly interesting learning experience. After spending an hour and a half reading a single two-page portion of a five-page letter, I learned that Americans always have had and always will have horrendous handwriting. Um, and then my reader was kind enough to inform me, no, actually, you're just not good at reading 18th century handwriting. Uh, you'll get a lot better at it if you practice. So maybe that's just me. Um, I also found out the hard way that even librarians can lose things, um, especially when there's two people named R.M. Wheeler that left their uh, papers and materials to the same library. Um, I was looking for Richard M. Wheeler's stuff. They left me with R. Michael Wheeler's stuff. So it only took me about 25 minutes to figure that one out as well. Um, the most surprising discovery I made um, in the course of my research was that the uh, uh, county of Frederick uh, in Maryland has a surprisingly rich barbecue culture. Um, it's a place that nobody today would ever associate with barbecue. You might think of the South. Uh, more deep than that, Alabama, South Carolina, maybe Memphis or Texas. 
but Frederick County, Maryland was a hotbed for barbecue uh, from 1800 to 1809. In particular, um, newspaper articles from the first two decades in the 19th century in Frederick County describe deeply contentious events on um, the witness things like the intentional scheduling of conflicting barbecues so people didn't have to give speeches against their rivals, the intentional poisoning, uh, sorry, intentional poisoning of a well at one barbecue ground by the other party, uh, and the most crazy event was when um, where a guy realized he was going to lose the election to his own uh, a fellow party member, so got up, took his umbrella, turned it upside down, and beat the guy over the head with it so he couldn't give his speech anymore. Um, unfortunately, the wealth of sources in Frederick County was an exception. The most difficult part of my thesis was piecing together an overarching narrative from a disparate collection of sources. Um, few people organizing these events left their materials behind. They weren't kind enough to say, this is why I held this barbecue here. Uh, instead, I was mostly piecing together um, evidence for people that had attended these barbecues. Some of them were things you might expect, newspapers, letters, and journals, uh, and some were a lot more unique. Things like satirical pamphlets that gave me the pig sauce line, um, or my personal favorite, a public notice published in South Carolina that explained one man's reasoning for a duel where he killed the other fellow. Um, in the end, I spent far more time trying to understand how all these pieces fit together than actually writing my thesis, and that's a, a real plug for a lot of the guys I've talked about saying that it's about research and not necessarily writing. You're going to spend a lot of time with it and really dive into it. Um, the key takeaway from the story, though, and the one thing I hope you remember from this talk is that barbecue was and is a political institution in this country. Whether it was in the era after the founding of the New Republic, when early political, leader, early political leaders used uh, Fourth of July barbecues in particular to cultivate an American political identity, later when the popularization of explicitly political barbecues contributed to the development of a kind of personality politics that you see today. In the United States, we ask things in election seasons like, who would you rather have at a barbecue? I don't think Angela Merkel faces the same question in Germany. Um, or in the 20th century, when commercialized barbecue maintains its political nature by playing a role in cases surrounding desegregation or the development of American political ideals surrounding the family or those backyard barbecue questions. Um, barbecue as a whole in the United States has really forever been used as a, as, as a political tool. Um, and now, having uh, finished my thesis and had a whole two days of hindsight and the champagne hangovers worn off, uh, I think I can share two bits of advice with the underclassmen. The first is obvious and corny, um, but helpful nonetheless. Pick something you're really excited about working on. Writing a good thesis requires hours and days spent researching and writing, and that time will be miserable if you don't enjoy the topic. My interest in the intersection of barbecue and politics made it relatively easy and honestly enjoyable to sit down in Papa and write my thesis. Um, and I promise your life and your final product will be much better if you write about something you enjoy. Um, and my second piece of advice is far more practical. Don't be afraid to ask someone for money. Um, Doing field research or doing archival research is something that's a really special experience. You're going to learn a lot, a lot more than you can going through databases in PAPA. So don't be afraid to reach out, ask someone in your department, ask your reader, ask around. There's probably a good chance someone on campus will fund you to take a trip to do thesis research. And it was the most rewarding part of my experience as well. So don't be afraid to ask for money because it's probably out there for you. So I'm sure all of you thought we were done at this point. Uh, I promise yeah. I will give you the quickest cybersecurity primer that has ever existed. Um, thank you for still being here, uh, I really should say. And before I get started, I want to thank two incredible women that are in the room, one being Priya, the other one being my thesis advisor, Professor Ta. You both have empowered me more than I can ever say throughout the year, so thank you for that. Um, so cyberspace has been an interest of mine for, or cybersecurity, I, I amend, um, for the past few years. Uh, it's does everything in which I, I could hope for. It merges tech and defense. Um, and it's, it's really served as a field that is incredibly nascent, but is ever evolving. And with that means that there are growing pains. And one of them being the security model that has developed around it, which is public and private partnerships. Um, so through my, my thesis research this past year, I had the opportunity to interview key stakeholders from both the private sector and the public sector, of which I will present some of the findings um, with you here today. And so first, cyberspace uh, is, is an incredibly unique domain um, because the securitization of it really involves 
cooperation from both the private sector and the public sector, and that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being cyberspace is a shared domain, uh, which means that the responsibility lies both with the private sector and the public sector. Um, the private sector owns and operates about 85% of critical infrastructure, uh, of which are necessary to the state, and protecting that cyber domain uh, means that responsibility is diffused between the two. And so public and private partnerships were created post 9-11 to make sure that we are able to secure uh, that space to the best of our ability and really create that cohesion. Um, and with anything, like I mentioned, growing pains, um, it's been effective in certain instances, uh, and, and there's some sizable amount that is left to develop. Um, and so through the interviews I was able to conduct, uh, most of the perspectives diverged, which is not shocking if you're familiar with the private sector and the public sector cooperation in matters of homeland security and defense. Uh, but I'll speak to you, uh, I'll, I'll share with you the areas in which uh, the two managed to agree, which were far and, and few in between, um, but were important. Uh, the first part is that, uh, I, sh I should probably preface this way, by explaining what pr public and private partnerships are. Um, they're cooperatives, again, that really merge two sides of the aisle, and they're intended for three main purposes. One being information sharing, so uh, sharing cyber threat intelligence um, between the two sides. The second being uh, incident response. So if the private, uh, private sector institution uh, is breached and they need the public sector help. Uh, there are government organizations that then will send teams uh, that will help with incident response, uh, meaning mitigating threats and making sure that your networks are back online and safely. And the, lastly, uh, the last thing is that because it is such a nascent field, there is a lot left uh, to be developed in terms of best practices uh, and policy around it. So getting, um, as, as one of my uh, the stakeholders that I was able to chat with said, uh, really public-private partnership models are important for getting butts in seats uh, and sharing information and best practices. Um, so the parts where they agreed upon are that one, uh, public-private partnerships are, are incredibly necessary uh, because the are, there are national security implications when it comes to securing cyberspace. Uh, the second is that there is a, an incredible power vacuum um, in the federal government in terms of who controls cybersecurity matters. Uh, post 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security was created in which then they were put as the, uh, the premier uh, federal organization for our, to streamline all cybersecurity matters through. Uh, but there's a power struggle in the government, which is, again, I'm sure if you're familiar with the bureaucracy in the government, is not entirely shocking, but slightly scary when it comes to national security um, considerations. And so no federal agency actually knows who's in charge. Um, the second thing is that uh, to make sure that the private sector gets involved and to really incentivize that, uh, it's too early because the model is so nascent um, to really regulate through financial regulations. Uh, I was told that the best metaphor is to uh, regulate via carrots and not sticks. So regulate via tax incentives uh, and other lucrative offers, but not through financial penalties. Um, and lastly, that there are a lot of shortcomings in the model, but they do have their success stories. Um, but what is important to note is that if nothing is done to really merge those shortcomings, uh, the information sort of uh, failures that have occurred that occurred uh, in the lead up to 9-11, um, there, there's a lot of talk in the industry, and, and this might be an outlandish metaphor, uh, but a cyber 9-11 uh, sort of uh, word is, is thrown around in that if we don't merge these intelligence failures, if, if we're not able to make sure that cooperation is done at the best of the ability and to incentivize cooperation, um, that we're dealing with a major national security failure in the future. And so I'll end on that happy note, um, but thank you so much for being here and, and thanks again for sticking around. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, if our senior speakers are gonna stick around for a few minutes, I'm sure they'll, if you have questions for them, just mosey around. Thank you.